Genesis chapter one. I don't have to say the verses because we're gonna do the whole chapter. I think that uh, every one of us will be challenged to believe what God said about creation or what the unbelieving world claim. Claims are by an untested science. <clears throat> Let me say that again. We will be challenged to believe what God said about creation or what the unbelieving world claims by an untested science. When science began to really grow during the time of Darwin and his existence, that's when things seemed to all of a sudden change for the biblical perspective on creation. Because you had a guy here who came up with a theory that the hypotenuse was that we literally evolved from cells in the ocean and became monkeys and eventually became man. And the premise or the evidence of that would be time. That given enough time, given enough time, you will see the evolution process. And of course, this is how they safeguard themselves. It takes billions and billions of years before something can literally happen. Well, guess what? You won't be around for a billion years, so it's never gonna happen. <clears throat> but I think that the church fell for that. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the science, not a whole lot, but just get you through here. So as Christians, we, we believe in the literal six-day creation. And maybe there are some of you here that, that don't, and I don't mean to, to offend you at all, but I'm coming from the perspective that I believe the Bible literally from Genesis to Revelation. That's my stance. I believe what Jesus said throughout the New Testament. And those that uh, don't, it's because they haven't read the New Testament or when they read it, they take it metaphorically. They subjectively put in their thoughts what they think it's saying. And so as a Christian, that's the perspective that I'm coming from. And I say that and make that clear because I'm a little bummed out um, that I got called on um, something uh, this last week. Uh, somebody had, had uh, posted something and I just put on there a concern about what they're doing. And then someone else said, that wasn't very nice of you. And I thought, wow, was he, was I totally misunderstood. I was concerned for the person and they totally took it as a bash. And I, I said, I, I'm not you know, bashing her. I'm concerned for their health and their safety and what they're doing. There's a proper way of, of doing that. And of course, there was no response. And then the person explained that they were doing that. I go, well, there you go. That's exactly what I was saying. You need to do that. But it's hurtful as a pastor, and, and you get it all the time, uh, where, where people just uh, bash you on, on your beliefs or get offended or... Um, let you know that you don't know what you're talking about. I remember uh, one lady after counseling them and then dealing with her that I knew nothing. I wasn't even a good pastor, should be stepping down and shouldn't even uh, be here in this church. And that's why the church will never grow again. How many times I've heard that. So I'm sorry, I'm just I'm ranting off there. So I believe in a literal translation of the scriptures. And I also believe that when it's speaking metaphorically, it's speaking metaphorically, okay? But when it's speaking literally, it's speaking literally. And I think Genesis um, is speaking literally. And I can, I can prove this as far as God. In John 5, 45 through 47, it says, do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is none who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words, Jesus said. And so here Jesus himself says, if you believe Moses' writings, then how will you believe my word? He's equating his writings at, to Jesus' words. That's literal. And Moses wrote the book of Genesis. And so Jesus is saying, if you believe Moses, you should believe me because Moses wrote the truth. And in this passage, Jesus is making that very clear that one must believe what Moses wrote. And one of, the, one of the passages in the writings of Moses is Exodus. So if Jesus said Moses wrote the truth, listen to Exodus 20, 11, what it states. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, 
and the rest of the seventh and, the, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So he's very clear there in Exodus, Moses, how the Lord created the heavens and the earth in six days. So this, of course, is the basis for the seven-day week, six days work, and one day of rest. So obviously this passage was meant to be taken as speaking of a total seven literal day basis on the creation week of six literal days of work and one literal day of creational rest. And so God created the heavens and the earth, but let's go beyond that. Because Jesus created the heavens and earth, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Let me break up this chapter. Well, before I do that, let me back up again. Let me back up again. Back in March 4th, 1980, there was a man called Westcott. And this is what he wrote. No one now, I suppose, holds that the first three chapters of Genesis, for example gives a literal history. I could never understand how many, one reading them with open eyes, could think they did. And so he's saying that the first three chapters of Genesis is not literal, and he can't understand why people would think that. Hort, another commentator, said, I am inclined to think that no such state as Eden ever existed. But the book which has most engaged me is Darwin. My feeling is strong that the theory is unanswerable. Isn't that interesting? So I came up with this quote. If the book of Genesis is not the literal narrative of history, then Jesus is a liar. And we know that Jesus is not a liar. Matthew 19, 4. He answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female. Very clear. I rest my case. But it's interesting because we're not objective. And we need to be objective. And even myself at times when I'm translating the scriptures, I have to be careful that I am not putting in my own thoughts. I have to be objective. And so I have to slow down and think objectively and not subjectively not add in the scriptures because I can take that, a person can take that same scripture 19 and he can say, Jesus never said this. He never said that creation was literal. He never said that. He never said that the man Adam even existed. All he did was quote from there. So it could have been a metaphor and Jesus is just quoting it. But see, that's an argument from, from, um, oh, what is it? Um, I lost it. There you go. From silence. That's an argument of silence. Because they're saying, because it's not there, thus it must be true. <clears throat> well, the Trinity is not in the scriptures, and yet we see a triune God. So you can't use that argument, the argument from silence. Uh, Jesus also you know, didn't say a lot of other things, so does that mean all those other things aren't true? That's subjective, and you're putting thoughts in there that, that aren't there. Jesus basically said that God created Adam and Eve. Simple and clear. And if you read the context, there's little metaphors there whatsoever. All right, let's get to the text. Um, Let me break this up for you because I have the time just so you get a feel for the whole context here. In in verses one and two, we're gonna see God literally create the heavens and the earth. And then we're gonna stop there for a second and talk about the gap theory. Anybody hear about the gap theory? I know a few of you have heard about the gap theory and it kind of relates to what my introduction is. There's a gap theory. But again, the word theory, uh, go back to, to 1970 and you'll understand the true meaning of theory. Today, theory means something totally different. Um, <clears throat> three through five, actually uh, three through 30, uh, then we, we get the days of creation. So we're gonna see the created, creation of light, the firmament, the, the separation of dry land. Uh, 14 through 19, the, the sun, the moon, and the stars created the fish, the fowl. In 20 to 23, uh, 24 and 25, cattle, wild beasts, creeping things on the earth, even cockroaches that we're dealing with today were created. I, I think maybe they, were be, they weren't created before the fall, or were they? Maybe they weren't a nuisance back then, I don't know. I don't know, that's a subjection. Uh, 26 through 28, we see the creation of man in God's own image. And we'll talk a little bit about that. What does that mean in God's image, uh, literally? Because some think that, that we are literally in God's image. 
Literally, this is what God looked like. Not me, but human. You know, um, I remember seeing a TBN special, African-American pastor who was teaching about God's image, and then he, he ushered a crucifixion with God's image into the scripture and said, this is what I believe God looked like. And it was him on the cross, an African-American on the cross itself. Talk about total subjection. So um, it's not what we think it is. And then 29 through 31 grants uh, the, the fruit of the earth for, for food. So interesting stuff. <clears throat> One thing that I'm going to do in this chapter, I'm going to try to do it through Genesis, but we'll see is pull out some types, typologies. Now, I do have to warn you that typologies, you know, sometimes can be subjective, and so you have to be careful. But if you can uh, see the picture there, you can see a principle along with it. And there are pictures there. If, if you remember, I think it's chapter 3, uh, when God uh, brings the curse on the woman, and it says that, um, that you'll have a seed, and, and, and uh, his seed will try to you know, bite the heel of your seed, but your seed will crush his head. And so there's that picture there. And he is speaking metaphorically in that place there, but he's speaking of the future, and that is of Jesus Christ on the cross who crushes the head of Satan. So that's very clear there. So we'll try to stay clear, uh, very clear. But uh, don't take it dogmatically. Um, it, it's just uh, interesting to see from time to time. Uh, John 5, 39 says, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and in these are they which testify of me, Jesus said. So all the scriptures testify of Jesus Christ. Now, I am one that loves to read the scriptures. I, I just love the scriptures. They excite me when I read them. I don't know why. Maybe it's my calling. Uh, and I would agree with you if you were to say it because you're a pastor, you know, but I don't think it has to be that way because I know people who are not pastors who have the same passion, the same hunger and a desire for the word of God. They get joyful when they hear it especially when they find something wonderful in it and so reading the word of god is so so powerful for our lives uh, we find who jesus in the word of god and the more we find jesus the more we find strength in our life so let's look at god creating heaven and earth in verses one and two in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth pretty clear in the beginning the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So in the beginning, which is a time period that's unknown, he doesn't tell us when that beginning was, but the beginning was in the beginning God. So wherever that was, it was somewhere in the beginning, but we don't know. It could be a hundred Years before creation, it could be billions, but I think it's eternal because God is eternal. And we have enough evidence in Scripture to tell us that God is an eternal God. There is no beginning with God. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, no beginning and no end. So in the beginning, there was God, and He created the heavens and earth. Proverbs 8.22 says, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of His way. Before his works of old, I have been established from everlasting, from the beginning, before there was ever an earth. And so God, I think uh, Paul talks about that, that, that we've been known before the foundations of the world. Uh, not that the Mormon doctrine says that we were there and then God uh, sent us to earth to be born. That's not true. God knew us in our minds. He knows everything. And if you're eternal and you know past, present, and future, then God can go anywhere at any time. And he, he already knows what tomorrow brings because he can be there, which brings up a whole lot of interesting stuff. You know. But it's interesting because in the beginning, God existed before anything else existed. Psalms 102, of old you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. Now, does God literally have hands? No, he doesn't literally have hands. Uh, again, what he's saying here is it's the work of God. And, and like we who have hands can do that work, God laid the foundations of the earth with his hands. Remember John chapter four, God is what? Spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So God is a spirit. Jesus was with him in the beginning. Jesus could become anything. You remember Joshua 
where all of a sudden the angel of the Lord came to him and he immediately bowed down and the angel didn't tell him to get up because it was Jesus pre-incarnate. And so Jesus could do that because he was spirit. He hadn't been pre, uh, uh, he had not been incarnate yet, born of the Virgin Mary. Today, now Jesus is Jesus and he's there in his bodily form. That's what he gave up in glory. So, you know, we, we read this stuff and be careful because God doesn't have hands. That's not really what it's saying. Isaiah 40, 21. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understand from the foundation of the earth? Uh, John 1, 1. We love this one. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And 14 says, and the word became flesh and, we do, and he dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten son. And that's speaking of Jesus Christ. Verse two says, he was in the beginning with God. So there's a scripture about Jesus being in the beginning with God himself. Hebrews 1.10, you Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. This is Hebrew, the apostle Paul telling us that the earth was created by God himself. The word God there is interesting. We talked about the Trinity. Uh, this word God um, in Hebrew signifies strong, mighty. It is expressed in omnipotent. Um, it is a word that speaks about the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, the actual Hebrew word is Elohim. The word Elo or El is one, Ohim is plural. And so what it's saying is that there's three in one there when you look at the, the Hebrew definition of that word. Colossians says, who is in the image of the invisible God, speaking of Jesus Christ, the firstborn of every creature. Now, Jehovah Witnesses will take that, say, aha, Jesus was the firstborn. Of over every creature he's not God because he's the first born he was born that's not what it's saying when you look at it in the Greek what it's saying he's the first born over all things you know he's the first uh, above everything else he has preeminence keep reading you'll see that for by him were all things created okay so if everything was created and it was created before in the beginning he's before all that uh, that is in heaven and that is on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. So the context is speaking about Jesus being the first over everything. He was in the beginning. <clears throat> a lot of scriptures on that but let me go to to the next scripture created another interesting word the word there I have in my Bible here in verse 1 is um, I believe it's bara and the word bara means something from nothing in the Hebrew and so when he said created he's saying that God took nothing and he created into something. He didn't take something that already existed and put it all together. It was something that he did completely out of nothing. And of course, you've all heard the joke, right, about the scientists who finally figured out the proteins in the creation of man, right? You all heard the, that joke, right? They all figured out that it takes so many proteins and then you can actually create life and so forth. And so the scientists were like, all right, we find it. We are creators. God has nothing on us anymore. So like, we did it. And so God says, I'll tell you what, I challenge you. How about I create something out of nothing? And so God then creates this wonderful thing out of nothing. And they're like, wow, okay, well, here we go. And they go grab some dirt and other things. And the guy says, oh, no, 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 you get nothing create that but oh but of course they can't because they need dirt they're not god scientists are not god only god created uh, the earth out of nothing the heaven and the earth speaking of uh, the universe uh, completely now as christians we believe god jesus created everything so i want to give you some scriptures and then i gave you a few but i want to 
give you some more just so that you see that Jesus himself is the creator of all things. When you read Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It's, it's under the New Revised or New American Standard Bible. It is I who made the earth. I created man upon it. I stretched out the heavens with my hands and I ordained all their hosts, Isaiah 45, 12. Both of these passages tell us that God created everything. Now, there are many other passages we could read, but these give us the facts. Isaiah's passage is very meaningful because God declares that he created everything, human, heaven, earth, stars, planets, moons, everything. But scripture tells us that it's Jesus who created everything. When you go to Colossians 1, 6, and we read it, I'm going to read it again, listen to it again. For by him, capital H, Jesus, all things were created, both in heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. That pretty much is everything, right? Anything visible and invisible. Uh, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. And by the way, rulers and authorities, God put Obama where he's at for a reason. I know we don't like it, and, and there are many that would like to, you know, literally impeach him, <laughs> right? But God put him there because God is the creator, Colossians 1.16. The pronoun him refers to Jesus here, as I said. He made the heavens, the stars, the planets, the moons, the earth, everything that exists. But not only did Jesus create everything but he continues to hold everything together too first corinthians 8 6 jesus christ by whom are all things and we exist through him it's pretty clear we exist through him himself and i'm reading from the new american standard version all things came into being by him and apart from him nothing can into being that has come into being john 1 3 now listen to Hebrews 1, 2, and what it says. But of the Son, he says. Now this is God speaking to the Son. If you ever get a chance, read Hebrews chapter 1. It's an interesting conversation between God and his Son. And in God the Father literally calls the Son God. And you're like, what? You mean there's two gods? No, there's only one God. But I'm God the Father, and he's God the Father, and he's speaking to God the Son. That's interesting conversation there. So it says, but, to the, but of the Son, he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And thou, Lord, in the beginning, didst lay the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. So the Father himself is saying that Jesus did it. Isn't that awesome? You guys are tired. I think that's awesome. We have a savior that's the creator. He's not a man. He's not a mere man who died on a cross for my sins, who has sins, but he's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's pure and perfect and holy. And if he created the heavens and the earth, how much more can he do for us? Why do we worry so much? Why do we not trust and have faith in him? He can do anything. If he put the governments in place, there's a good reason for it. I'm not saying we shouldn't vote and we shouldn't fight against evil. I'm not saying that at all. Don't misunderstand me. Hear what I'm saying. I'm saying God has a purpose for it and we have to accept that purpose for our life. If it means persecution for the church, then so be it because the Bible is clear, even in the Beatitudes, that we will suffer persecution. Who's to say that we're the generation that doesn't suffer at all? And who are we to tell the creator, why have you made me like this, as Paul said? You know, we have to believe in God. So here the earth is without form and without void in Genesis. Um, that's just a way of saying there's a lot of confusion. There's nothing there. It's emptiness. This is before he begins to populate it and bring about his creation, this globe. Uh, undescribed period uh, uh, that is happening here. We don't know when and so forth that this took place, but it says the Spirit of God moved. Literally continued brooding over it in a sense, kind of like a, a hen over its chicks. Uh, the Spirit began to move. Here's the work of the Spirit as he works and hovers over the universe. 
Now, this is where some say that there is a gap between verse 1 and 2. Did you read anything that said there's a gap there? I didn't read anything that, that says there's a gap there, but there are some that are, I guess are smarter than God, and they say there's a gap there. Uh, Jesus doesn't say there's a gap there. None of the apostles say there's a gap there. It's only the scientists and those that believe in evolution that call themselves Christians say that there's a gap there. And they believe that that gap theory, and that's all it is, is a theory. In school, we were taught that theory is not true until you prove it to be true. It is a hypothesis. And I know I'm not saying that right, but it is just a a a thought that possibly could be but you can't prove that it is and so it's just a theory until it is proven that it is and so is evolution by the way it's a theory but today scientists have turned it around well a theory doesn't have to be proved anymore it, it can have enough partial or, or or enough pointing in that direction that it's got to be true in a sense is what they say today and that just isn't true what is the gap theory? Let me read what Henry M. Morris, who has a PhD, wrote a book, Evidence on Creation. One of the, this is what he writes, one of the popular devices for trying to accommodate the evolutionary age of the geologists and astronomers is the creation record of the Bible has been the gap theory, also called the, the ruin and reconstruction theory. According to this concept, Genesis 1-1 describes the initial creation of the universe. Following this, the standard events of cosmic evolution took place, which eventually produced our solar system about 5 billion years ago. Then on Earth, the various uh, geological age followed, as identified by their respective, uh, I can't read all of his big words, uh, assemblages of fossils. Uh, but then occurred a devastating global catastrophe, destroying all life on earth and leaving a vast fossil graveyard everywhere. This situation is then said to be what is described in Genesis 2. Now, did you read any of that in there at all? I didn't. And, and, you, and if you've read the Bible, you haven't read it anywhere else. But this is what the people uh, say happened. Of course, you can't prove it because they weren't there, right? Verse 2 says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Uh, the, the cataclysmic is thought to have occurred as a result of the rebellion of Satan and his angels against their creator in heaven, with God then casting them out of heaven to the earth. Now there's some truth to that, because in Isaiah it talks about how God cast him down and he hid under the rocks. Now when is that? It doesn't say. It could have been when the earth was void and was in confusion. Uh, Satan doesn't need oxygen. It doesn't need our atmosphere. He's a created angel. It could have been at that point. And then when God's creating everything, he's seeing all this and he takes the opportunity then to, to deceive uh, Eve. Those who advocate the gap theory agree that the six days of creation week were literal. So they agree with us. But they... Inter interpret them only as days of creation and God creating again many of the kinds of animals and plants destroyed in the catechism. Uh, what they believe is is that when everything was destroyed, God then recreated everything and started the evolution. Um, one of the theories when, when Jesus talked about Adam, he says, uh, he says that, that God didn't say that Adam was the only one created first either. There could have been cavemen before Adam that were created so again it's all theory and it's not true so that's the gap theory it's i don't believe in the gap theory there are plenty of theologians that that do but they all disagree with each other anyway uh, one of the types that we can probably get out of this is the world is void and and in darkness without jesus uh we are in void and without darkness too. And that's a principle that we should understand that unless we have Jesus, we're lost. We're living in the dark. We're walking in dark. In fact, Paul in Ephesians says, you are darkness. Uh, that's hard to grasp when you think about it. That means you are. He says, you are darkness. Not that you're living in it. You are. Your, your soul, your personality, everything that you do, is, it's all about self and it's in darkness himself. 
But then comes the Holy Spirit and he hovers over you and he comes into you and he begins to do a new work in your life and you become a new creature in Christ Jesus and behold the old things pass away and behold all things become true. So a beautiful picture of the work of God in a dark place. Then the first day comes and it says, God said. Now if God says it, that should settle it, right? <laughs> I know if I say it, that sure doesn't settle it. <laughs> you know, don't live in my house. <laughs> my word doesn't have a lot of weight. It doesn't seem like anywhere. Let there be light, he said, and there was light. Pretty simple. That's a, that's a pretty awesome God, don't you think? Let there be light. Okay, <laughs> just like that. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And you can get some types there, right? We're of the light, the world's of the darkness. And we're to walk in the light and not in darkness. So you see that uh, uh, contrasting um, principle there. God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day there. So in verse 3, we have basically the light switch. Everything just is turned on. And God begins to work uh, in in his wonderful work there. Um, the, The dividing of the light from darkness... We really don't know what it, that is. I know as we get in here, we're going to see the firmament and how it's divided. At that time, there was no water, and God had to gather the water together, and things were separated. The water was above, and there was a mist uh, above in the atmosphere. Um, some Christians who, who look at that and have theorized, uh, again, theory, theorized this is why Adam lived so long, uh, because the, the oxygen was... Pfft, uh, better than what we even have today. Uh, the atmosphere, the, the UV rays were all blocked. I mean, he, he lived hundreds and hundreds of years. And when the fall of man came in, that's when destruction came in, things changed. And so the ozone now is visible and man began to die off quicker and, and so forth. So again, that's a, a theory and it's not uh, literally in scripture, but you can kind of see that possibly. Now, in verses 6 to 8, we see the second day, the firmament. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heavens. So that is the heavens, and there were water above and below, a midst that kind of seemed to be there. And then God divided that, the heavens from uh, the earth. And so evening and the morning were the second day. Now this firmament, it's an expansion in the Hebrew. A beating out as a metal plate, they describe it. So if you can imagine a metal plate and you're beating it and it's spreading, kind of expanding uh, around the earth. It was a name given to the atmosphere from its appearing to be observed to be a vault of heaven supporting the weight of the watery clouds above it. That's what the firmament uh, is describing. And Christ divides that firmament. Uh, the Hebrew word is rapai, which means the airspace between the heavens in Hebrew. Now there's a type here. Can anyone guess what the type is? Is that Christ is our living waters. He's our living water. And if we drink of him, uh, we will be satisfied. Chapter or verse 9 through 13 separates the dry land, which is the third day. So we come to the third day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place. And let the dry land appear. And it was so. Again, I love that when it says that. And God called the dry land earth. And so you see what's happening? God is taking the water and the earth and he's separating them. Now, imagine the earth without water. You ever hear the, the um, scientists talk about the, the plates shifting, the, the continents floating away from each other? Guess what? It's not true. Remove the water. There's land there 
and nothing's shifting. The waters are either lowering or raising, which gives the appearance that things are separating or coming together. But when you remove the water, there's land. Google it. And they try to take pictures of, of the ocean underwater. And when they do, they're finding all the land and the rocks. There are mountains that are bigger than what we have here. It's all connected because we're on earth. Scientists are smart, though, <laughs> aren't they? It's a lie. And they tell us this in school. God separated the land from the water, and God saw that it was good. Then in verse 11, then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herbs uh, that yield seed, and the fruit trees that yield fruit according to its kind. Now that's the first mention of according to its kind. And you're going to start to see this. When God all of a sudden says that I'm going to create something and then I'm going to do it according to its kind. When he says that, what he's saying is, is, is if you're a vegetable, then there are going to be vegetables. If you are a dog, then you will have dogs. If you are a chicken, then you will have chickens. But chickens can't have dogs and dogs can't have chickens. Only according to its kind. This is how God did it. Now, the evolutionists will say, oh, but dogs have evolved. No, they haven't. A dog is still a dog. But you have poodles, and you have Great Danes, or you have Wilbur, you know, <laughs> a pig. But you don't have evolution in there. You might have what they call, what we call microevolution, where there's variances, just like human beings. I'm a human being, you're a human being. Virginia and I were just talking, and I said, I said to her, what is, uh, what is Luke going to write on his application? Is he going to say white? Is he going to be Mexican? Or is he Filipino? What is he going to write? She goes, that's why I hate that stuff, because it shouldn't matter what you are. You know, God doesn't matter. We're all human beings. Uh, none of us can have goats or pigs, because that would be totally out of its kind. So you don't find that. You don't find that at all. Well, yeah, you do. The apes. What about Lucy? It was a lie. It was a lie, and it's been proven. But it's still in the books. Yeah, because they want you to believe the lie. Well, there's, there's a missing link. Yeah, and it's been missing since the 1800s. You know, uh, again, giving enough time. Yeah, because they're betting on billions years from now it's going to happen. Well, we won't be here. But that's okay. Just realize you're an animal so you can live like one. See, that's the downfall of evolution because it's survival of the fittest. And I, think, I really believe subconsciously that's why we see what's going on in the world today because it is survival of the fittest. Uh, there's some evidence that Obama and, and a lot of leaders are, are trying to unify the world so that they become the world leaders. That's survival of the fittest. It's known that Hitler did what he did because it's survival of the fittest. They are the supreme beings of society and everyone else needs to be destroyed, especially the Jews. They're worse than apes. The Germans called the Jews apes. And, and what we did in, the, in our country in the earlier times was the African Americans were apes. You know, See, it's, they're not prejudiced. They'll use whatever it is to destroy the weaker so that the superior will rule. Uh, and I really believe that because they believe in evolution. But if you believe in creation, you don't get that at all in creation. We're all created equal in the image of our maker. And let me go on because I know we're running out of time. That God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herbs, um, verse 12. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seeds according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind, then God saw that it was good. Second time he said it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. <clears throat> now we come to um, 14 through 19, where he forms the sun, the moon, the stars on the fourth day. Just a thought. Fourth day he forms what? The moon, the stars, and all that. So the earth was created before it. There's something wrong there. I thought the earth blew up and then everything became part of it. There's even some Christians that think when the earth blew up and all these planets began to form, when you look at the planets, some of the planets are rotating in different um, directions. Now, if the planet blew up, would that happen? Possibly. But how about if God just put them there 
because he wanted to. Why can't we believe that? Because the fourth day he decided to create the sun, the moon, the stars, and put them there. And God said, let there be light in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. So here's where God devises the winter, the summer, the fall, and the springs. You know, I probably said that out of order, but you you get what I'm saying there. Um, He divided for seasons. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Again, second time. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fifth fourth day so so you have seen so far you have seen so far two heavens you see that he divided the waters with the heavens the atmosphere the atmosphere that were that's the first heaven Uh, above us is the first heaven the second heaven is where he put the stars what is our sun a star he put the sun there so that it'll light the earth. And so we get the light from the sun or we get the light in the evening at night from the stars. So he illuminated the earth that way. That was the fourth day when he created all of that. Awesome. <laughs> 20 through 23. Uh, he then now puts the fish and fowls on the fifth day. Thank God for that because I love fishing. I love to go to Bishop and catch some trout. Used to be where I I would literally gut them and then try to eat them, but I normally didn't eat them. So now I just love fishing. I will catch them and I'll throw them back in. Sometimes I'll catch the same fish again if he's dumb enough. Or I'll be taking the fish off Virginia's hook because she's catching more than me and she don't like to take the fish off the hook. But thank God for fish and and all kinds of fish according to its kind listen then God said let the waters abound with an abundance of living creature how many abundance and we're still finding creatures that are just now being known in in the depths and depths of the sea itself some interesting creatures uh, that actually are lighting up you know and and look funny and so forth and God created all and let the birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament that is the heavens like they do today so god created great sea creatures uh, and every living thing that moves with which the waters abound according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind Uh, again he's separating the kinds and what he created and god blessed them god blessed them saying be fruitful multiply and fill the waters in the sea and let the birds multiply on the earth so the evening and the morning were the fifth day. I don't know the name of the bird, but it's interesting when Darwin, uh, a finch, he found the finch and he went to an island. When he found the finch, he found that the beak uh, was a certain size. And then he went uh, several years later, I believe. And when he went several years, the beak was literally bigger. And so he said, evolution in the process. And so he wrote some of his thesis on that. Well, you can go back there now and at different seasons and you can find that now they're smaller. That's de-evolution in the process. The reason that their beasts got longer is because the, the, the um, scarcity or scarcity of food or the winter time and the elements that were around. So, so that was not, or that was literally dis, disproven. God said, every kind of bird and according to its kind, multiply. And so you don't see birds with reptile tails flying around. Oh, yes, you do. The raptor or, or, or the brontosaurus or, or the leviathan. What about those? And again, I believe there are dinosaurs. You go to Job and he talks about the leviathan. Job chapter 40, I believe. And he talks about the tail being the size of a log. Uh, you find fossils. Ah, evidence that there are dinosaurs yeah you know you also find dinosaur fossils right next to men's footprints what 
How come they never told us that in school? Because they don't want you to know that. Because they want to believe in evolution. But they have literal fossils with men's feet. You can actually go there today, and, and it's a kind of a museum, and walk right along with it and see the men's feet along with dinosaur uh, fossils. Wow. Early in the state of California off the coast, a dinosaur washed up on the coast there. They got pictures of it. I'm a liar. Don't believe me. Check it out for yourself. And I think a responsible person that wants to know truth would literally check it out for themselves or believe the lie that someone told you. That's the problem with our nation. We rather believe the lie because we're too lazy sometimes to go check it out for ourselves. That's what gets us sent to hell. That's what gets us into trouble. Check it out for yourself and see if it's the truth. And if it's the truth, then man, die for it. Because that's what Islam does. That's why they're dying for, for their faith, their religion, because they believe that they want to be like their Muhammad who, who died for what he did to people. So God created the sea creatures and every living thing that moved with which the waters abound according to their kind and every winged thing according to its kind. God saw that it was good and God blessed them saying, be fruitful, multiply, fill the waters. And that was the fifth day. Now we come to 24 through 25. God then creates the cattle, the wild beasts and the creeping things. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind, cattle and creeping things and the beast of the earth's each according to its kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. God saw that it was good. Do you see why they have to say that Genesis is really a metaphor? It's a myth. It's just an allegory of, uh, of what they think happened because they're too primitive to understand what really happened in, in, with evolution and so forth because it's talking about its kind, its kind, its kind. You have to get rid of it in order to prove your text. Um, <clears throat> so cattle are cattle. Creeping things on the earth are creeping things according to its kind. 26 or 28, we see finally creation of man. And God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So we have image and likeness there. What do those two things mean? Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. There's one uh, definition. They are to have dominion because God has dominion. He's omnipotent, omnipresent, all-powerful, all-knowing, and everywhere omnipresent. He has dominion over things, so we are in his image and in his likeness, so we have dominion over things. Fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them. Now, stop there for one second. <clears throat> Did he create male and female the same way? No. He created Adam out of the dust of the earth. He created Eve out of Adam, okay, out of Adam. So he created them differently. Next week, uh, we'll go chapter two, and we're actually gonna review this. Uh, some people, again, subjectively, why are there two accounts of creation? Something's not right there, right? So we've got two accounts. <laughs> Can't believe the Bible. You got two accounts. Who would put two accounts? Are you serious? How many times do you tell a story and then retell it to give more details of that story? All the time. This is what God is doing. When you see Genesis chapter 2, God gives us a lot more details of what literally happened. So there's no problem with that whatsoever. I mean, we do this, you know, these guys who just hate God come up with all these things. And when you really logically look at it, you realize we do the, those things all the time. They're accusing of God not doing, you know, or that it's a lie. It's just amazing. <clears throat> Let us make them in our image. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male and female. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Just real quick, uh, we're to multiply. A and the reason for that is, is that we are to um, multiply God's children, um, not just fill the earth. 
Uh, we are to raise godly children to spread the gospel today to a dying world. And again, uh, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and everything, living things that move on the earth. The image and likeness. What does it really mean? In our image, this does not mean that God had a physical or a human body. Because again, John 4 says that God is spirit. So he's not saying that. Though God does not have a physical body, he designed man so man's physical body could do many of the things that God does. We can see, we can hear, we can smell, we can speak, we can think, we can plan. Because God does all those things. We're creating that image. Um, <clears throat> I believe it's uh, Paul who talks about the uncommunicable things of God and the communicable things of God. There are things that God does that we can do, like love. God loves, we can love. But God can create out of nothing. Can you do that? No. And so there are things that we can't. But the things that we can do, that God can do, that we can do, that's in his image and likeness. Uh, in our image, there are at least three aspects to the idea that we are made in God's image. It means human possesses personality, knowledge, feelings, and a will. This sets us apart from all animals and plants, right? Because plants and animals can't do that. And God didn't create everything from the fifth day on in his image or likeness. And so animals do not have dominion. Uh, they can't think or reason, um, I'd love to tell Wilbur to behave, sit down, and, and a lot of other things, but he just can't understand human language. But they do have a certain amount of abilities uh, to understand a certain amount. Now, when I go out to feed him, he just runs out the gate because he doesn't like me. I'm a man. He's a man. Virginia goes out there, and he sees this beautiful creation of God, and he does a little circle around her to let her know I love you, and then he goes off, you know? So there are certain things that, that the animals can do because God has created them that way. But Wilbur can't sit there and start talking to her like the cartoon says. Though, creation, though evolutionists would probably say they can. Only if God makes them because he made a donkey talk, right? With Balaam. It means human possesses morality. We're able to make moral judgments and have a conscience. It means humans possess a spirituality. Man is made for communion with God. It is on the level of spiritual communion with God. Animals don't have that. Sorry to say, but I lean, and maybe you don't, and that's fine. We'll find out when we get to heaven. But if Wilbur passes away, he probably will not be in heaven because he has no spirit doesn't have a communion with God. Will there be pigs in heaven? I'm sure there will be pigs in heaven because what we have here, God is gonna do way better there because God is going to be far better than what we have here. It's gotta be. But whether it's Wilbur or not, I don't know, but we will be in love with Wilbur's lookalike, you know? <laughs> That's my opinion, by the way, from, from just years of reading. So you don't have to agree with me on that. And I don't mean any offense. I'm not saying that God is mean or anything like that. You know, I'm just saying that's my opinion. So, pretty amazing how God created us in his image. Not necessarily to look like him. Again, the guy pulls out the cross and you see an African American on the cross and it's him. And I'm like, I can't believe this. This is insane what people will go through and then to hear some of these faith teachers that say well if i was jesus in fact i can die for the sins of the world too like what <laughs> because i'm created in the image of god and like god i heard freddie price the other day i'm dying when i'm good and ready because i have faith and my faith will keep me alive I'm like the bible says <laughs> you know read your bible freddie you got a phd but you don't know what you're talking about God said, see, I have, verse 29, uh, here God uh, grants uh, the fruit and the earth for food for, for mankind and for everyone else. And by the way, this is before the fall of man now. 
So all this food and earth, everyone gets to eat it. They're, they're, you know, lions aren't eating men. Their serpents aren't biting and things like that. And God says, see, I have given you every herb of the f- that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, and you shall, it shall be food for you. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life. I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. I mean, total vegetarian. Uh, <laughs> from God for everyone else, so he might be vegan. Then God saw everything that he made, that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So when he came to man, he said very good because he created him their image and likeness. And that was the sixth day that God created them. Next week we will, we will look at uh, this in a little bit more detail as God describes it. So let me give you some application before you you leave tonight. Uh, you were created for a purpose. God created you for a reason. He, you didn't evolve from some slime and cells and ultimately come off the water and billions of you flapping around until someone grew some arms and legs. You know, and then all of a sudden a billion more came out with arms and legs and then breathed all of a sudden. And then another billion came out because they didn't have a nose to breathe. And I mean, billions, and, I mean, it had to take billions and billions. God, you're, you're not just a cell. You are a human being created in the image and likeness of God. And that says something about you and the value you have in the eyes of God. You are worth a lot to God. So don't ever believe the lie of the enemy or your school teacher who tells you you're just a cell who came about. That's why the world is what it is today because they have fallen for that great lie. And Satan is laughing and he is laughing hard. We need to respect one another and honor one another because we are God's children. But when we begin to think that we're better, when we usurp ourselves above others, and we put others below us, that's when you're buying into the lie because God never intended that to be so. My wife is my God's daughter and I have to treat her that way. And she is precious to him and so she is precious to me. We don't always agree. And when we were learning, we learned how to box professionally against each other. (laughs) And now we just try to talk through it and we're just learning to accept one another more and more because we're both God's creation respect and honor one another because we're created in the image and likeness of God get out of that mentality that you're in the ghetto that you're of this ethnic background that you're not educated that <sighs> look at the apostles no God can use you in a mildly way when you realize who you are in Christ Jesus and what he has given you.